Good Shepherd, true bread, Jesus, do thou have mercy on us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the Saturday within the octave of Corpus Christi. Today is also the feast day of Our Lady of Grace, and the commemoration of the martyrs Saints Primus and Felician. Father Butler, in his notice for today's martyrs, who were ancient Romans, lived right outside of Rome. They were two brothers, converted only at about the age of 50 and baptized, and of all things at the age of 80, were taken to Rome and terribly tortured, and then made a glorious confession of their Catholic faith. Brother Butler says the secret of the saints and the martyrs is that they looked upon this world and everything in it as dumb. Now that's an interesting thought, because of course, if you want to get a good garden going, you've got to have some dung, some kind of manure, in order to, in order to fertilize everything, to make the flowers to grow and to blossom. That is to say that God the Holy Ghost uses all of the things of this world differently for each saint in order to bring about marvels of holiness. Uh, Father Dom Gange says today, says, well, some in the garden are roses and others in the garden are, are lilies and then probably some are eggplants and some are tomatoes. And yet they're all doing something glorious for God, using the circumstances of each individual's life. God does. And how does that grace of God get to each one of those individual souls? Why, it gets to them through Our Lady, whom you might call the most gracious gardener. There she is in her little gardening outfit, our Blessed Mother is, and she's got gloves on and she's not afraid to work hard. That is to say, she's always bringing God's grace to souls. And what is its source here below? It is the bread of the elect, the true shepherd, the true eternal bread, the blessed sacrament. That's a bit how we should be seeing things on earth, in God's garden, the mystical body of Christ, on this Saturday, the Feast of Our Lady of Grace, the, fe- the Saturday within the octave of Corpus Christi. Today is also the Feast Day of that marvelous mystic who lived during the time of the, of the revolutions, the Blessed Anna Maria Taigi in Rome. She's a good example of that, too, because she was a laywoman, she was a wife and a mother, and at the same time she had this other life that her husband never understood or appreciated, the life of a mystic and a prophetess and a visionary. And yet she always, according to the circumstances of her life, we would say the duties of her state of life, she always was, first of all, taking care of her husband, her home and her family, Her husband said of her later on, when I came home from work angry and cross, she would always calm and soothe me. And it wouldn't matter if there was a cardinal there in the living room talking to her and some noble lady. She would leave them graciously and come to take care of me. Why, he says, she would have taken off my shoes at the end of the day if I had let her. That's how devout she was in working her garden as God wanted her to do by the graces of her state of life. And of course, needless to say, each day, holy man, each day, as often as she could, in those circumstances, holy communion. And everyone in the household, the same rule. Holy mass in the morning, spiritual reading, rosary and devotions in the evening, a Christian household. All the saints different, the beauty of God's garden, and yet the source of that sanctity, the blessed sacrament on earth, and the means, our Blessed Lady, Our Lady of Grace. I can't resist telling you one little Eucharistic story today, which is an interesting one because it, it shows, took place in Milwaukee in the year 1847 with some Germans, and it shows that, that wonderful combination of Our Lady of Grace and the Blessed Sacrament. There was a priest in Milwaukee at that time, his name was Father Urbanic, and... Um, he had somehow formed a friendship with a Protestant family. I have the feeling maybe they came from the same place in Germany. Uh, this family was from Hanover in Germany. And they all spoke the same low German dialect together. Well, they were a couple of hours' drive outside the city. And he would sometimes go out to visit them. And, of course, he had as his goal to convert them. They were a Protestant family. The name was Polworth. 
he converted Mrs. Polworth fairly easily, but Mr. Polworth, under no circumstances, would either convert nor would he give permission for his children to be baptized. And this grieved the now devout mother, and it grieved the visiting priest very, very much. One day he um, he drove out to visit and had a long, long talk. Father did with Mr. Polworth. He had a thousand objections to every element of the Catholic faith. And he did this more than once. And finally he realized it would be quite useless. Yet at the same time, on a personal level, the priest and the Protestant, Mr. Polworth, were good friends. Um, I, I can see very well, as Father Urbanic said one day at the end of a visit, I can do nothing with you. And as he said those words, the priest was suddenly inspired with a great feeling of confidence in the Blessed Mother, in her intercession. And he said to him, but at least my friend promised me one thing. And what may that be, he said. He asked him in the, in the low German dialect. I will tell you after you've promised me, this old German priest, said he was smart. He wasn't going to give it away too early. It's not difficult, he said, and you can do it in good conscience after an argument going back and forth, because what would a German be unless you wanted to have an argument? After argument going back and forth, finally, um, thought Mr. Polworth agreed to do what the priest was going to ask him to do. What was it then? I want you to say one Hail Mary for my intentions every Sunday from now on. Just once a week, just on Sunday, that's all. And in a short time, you will experience a great change in your feelings, I assure you. Now, Mr. Polworth laughed at those words, but he gave his word, and he was a man of honor, and he kept his promise. He recited the Hail Mary. I don't know if he knew it by heart by then, or if he had to have it, a text and then he read it, but he said it every Sunday. Just two Sundays later, 14 days after that, uh, it wasn't on a Sunday, it was on a weekday, he uh, informed his wife, Mr. Polworth did, I'm going into Milwaukee to buy some new clothes for the children. And his wife was astonished. And she said, well, why now? Why on this particular day? Well, I've made up my mind to allow them to be baptized, was his reply. And the, the news, as news will, spread throughout the whole neighborhood and the town very, very quickly. Old Mr. Polworth is going to let his children be Catholic after all. And furthermore, he went in to see the priest when he bought the children their clothes, and he asked the priest to conduct the baptism in as solemn a fashion as possible. So the priest invited uh, another priest and two seminarians to come to assist him, and it took place on Sunday. This was a Sunday in July. You can imagine how hot it would have been. It made no difference. Sunday in July before the high mass. And it was done very beautifully and solemnly. And afterwards, as was the custom, the Blessed Sacrament was exposed on the altar, and the choir was singing the uh, Pange Lingua. The, the newly baptized children were standing right by the altar step, and the church was absolutely packed full of people who had come to see this marvel, and standing right, and then kneeling right behind their, his children was this Protestant gentleman, Mr. Polworth. During the exposition, he got the idea he wanted to look at the host in the monstrance, and yet the crowd of people was so heavy, he was afraid that if he stood up, it would seem to be irreverent, and he might disturb someone else. So they were packed in. But still that thought came to him, look at the host. So finally he did stand up, because that was the only way to get a view of the, of the sacred host, and when he did, the first time he saw the sacred host in the monstrance. He glanced away and he looked again a second time and he saw the Good Shepherd. He saw Jesus with a lamb on his shoulder. And he was just amazed. And he closed one eye and he looked again at the other and he closed another eye and he, he continued to see the Good Shepherd. And on his way out of church after benediction, he asked someone else if they had seen anything and that person said no. So he just kept it to himself. The next day, he invited the priest to come and pay him a visit at his, his at his home. And as soon as Father Urbanic entered the house, uh, Mr. Polworth said, Now indeed is the lost sheep found. 
after its long strain among the thorns. I wish to become a Catholic. And a few days later, he was received into the church after he had made a solemn profession of faith. And he attested by oath to all the circumstances of what he had done and what he had seen. And the grace that comes through Our Lady, imagine the man just said a couple of Hail Marys. The grace that comes in Our Lady is so abundant that sort of overflowed to some poor Presbyterian with a Calvinist idea of predestination. And he got in on the grace and he was converted and he was baptized the same day too. And then the the Bishop of Milwaukee gave permission in perpetuity for this particular parish always to have the um, a procession of the Blessed Sacrament on that day, which was um, uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the 16th of July in the year 1847, as a, as a perpetual memorial to the great miracle of conversion that had worked. How gracious Our Lady is. One Hail Mary said distractedly by a stubborn old German Protestant, and all of this grace overflows. How good Our Lady is, and how she draws souls to the Holy Eucharist. She did that in 1847. Why couldn't she do it now at the beginning of the 20th century, especially since the time is so late? Let us have a very great confidence in our Blessed Mother. Let us realize that our arguments are, well, sometimes they're just arguments, but our prayer through Our Lady, that is what is going to work the miracle. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.